What the Actual Fork podcast is co-hosted by two intuitive eating registered dietitians, yours truly, Sammy Previtt, owner of Fine Food Freedom, and Jenna Warner, owner of Happy Strong Healthy. We can't stand diet culture bullshit and love keeping it real. Our mission is for all humans to believe that they are made for so much more than chasing a smaller body. We are also here to share with you that food can be fun and pleasurable again. Although we are medical professionals, we are human too. We are not afraid to share our deepest, darkest secrets and how years of our lives were taken by diet culture. We started this podcast so no human has to feel alone in their journey towards food freedom. So get comfy and join us for a casual convo where you can expect to laugh, cry, learn, and grow. Welcome back to another episode of What the Actual Fork Podcast. Today we had Jenny Westernkamp, who is the founder of All Access Dietetics, which is a company dedicated to making it easier to become a dietitian with application support, RD exam preparation, and career development resources. And since 2008, they have helped thousands of RDs to be, to become actual dietitian. Um, and just side note, you know, this, no big deal. Jenny is also the team nutritionist for the Chicago Bulls. I mean, what I learned from this episode and from actually from all of season two so far for from all of the dietitians that we have interviewed is that our field is incredible. It is so vast. There are so many different spaces and places that you can work and she's a badass. And I'm also really glad that I became a dietitian 12 years ago and not today because <laughs> there's so much that goes into this. And she does such a great job really explaining and breaking down you know, how to navigate this career path. Um, and there's a, actually a lot of different pathways that we didn't even know existed until this conversation today. Um, that was so interesting to hear. Yeah. And we don't want to scare, no, the sorry. <laughs> but no, but I totally agree. Like that was the first thing we said when we stopped recording is like, thank God we're already dietitians, <laughs> but you know, speaking with Jenny, both on and off air, you know, her saying there are so many different pathways to become a dietitian now. So depending on, you know, if you already have a bachelor's degree in something else, or if you're in high school or like just getting the resources that you need to see the path you need to take. Um, and I thought it was really cool too, how she just talked about, you know, if you have failed the RD or even if you haven't taken the RD, just learning how to study for it. And I think it's so easy when I know I'm a terrible test taker. Like the mm -hmm. fact that I passed my RD exam the first time is a joke. I don't know how I did that, but, um, that like, just, that was really cool to hear her talk about because I get so many questions from students and I'm sure you do too. And now we can just give them this episode because my, my answers are usually, I don't really know. I took it so I long know. ago. Because so much has changed. And I think that that's important for us to put out there too, is that when we do get these questions, you know, to the best of our ability, we can answer them. But Jenny is somebody who has done and continues to do the research to keep up with the field, to understand the directions that it's going. And, you know, just like Sam and I have each invested in business coaching, this investment in understanding you know, how to navigate the dietitian career is so, it's so, there's so much value to it. Um, and it was really just a fascinating conversation and also really inspiring again to see an entrepreneur, a female entrepreneur, business owner who is kicking ass in so many different ways. I mean, if you're not a dietitian, but you're interested in or not an RD to be, or have no interest currently in becoming one, but you're interested in knowing what dietitians go through in order to get that credential, this is an awesome episode to listen to. It's very informative. Yes. So if you know any like nutrition students, people that want to be dietitians, send this episode their way because it will definitely be helpful. So let's jump right in. Welcome back to another episode of What the Actual Fork Podcast. Today, we have a rock star dietitian that lives 
and I say lives, works in two completely different worlds. So we're super excited to talk to Jenny Westerkamp, who is a registered dietitian um, and a CSSD. So thank you so much for being here with us, Jenny. Thanks, Sammy and Jenna. I'm excited to be on your amazing podcast. <laughs> we're, we're so, so excited. excited to have you. <laughs> <laughs> we are so excited to have you if you can't tell and I think it's really cool that we've interviewed so many CSSDs and I just have to say like before we get into this like when you intro yourself on here can you just explain a little bit more about what that is because I don't think we've ever stopped to do that before and all I know for sure is that I was so intimidated by how much work goes into that credential that I stopped before I even started even though it's what I've always wanted to do. <laughs> yes I could definitely so CSSD stands for Certified Specialist in Sports Dietetics and you typically, there's a, a few ways to be eligible to sit for the, the board exam that you have to take, but it, it ends up being, and I wish I knew the exact hours, but I think it's over a thousand hours under, or like in a sports nutrition setting, ideally like under a sports dietitian. And then, um, or you can get a master's and have that count towards some of your hours too. And then from there, you still need the field experience, but then you take that um, board exam, the CSSD exam, and then you can call yourself a CSSD and you have to retake the exam every five years. So I'm due for another one pretty soon here, but, uh, but yeah, there's study guides and research papers, position papers you can take to study and, and prepare for that and pass it. Amazing. Okay. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> so <laughs> much, so much work that goes into that. I know a few, well, we all know a few CSSDs here and just like the amount of work and the exam and everything is crazy. Um, so Obviously, Jenny, like we said, you have like two different worlds that you work in, one being all access dietetics, where you work with nutrition students and really get them ready to, you know, become RDs in their dietetic programs. But then you're also the sports dietitian for the Chicago Bulls. So we would love to just start this podcast. We have so many students that listen and just so many people interested in the field of dietetics. How did you get to where you are today? And, and how did you pave th this way so successfully in two totally different arenas? Okay, I'll try to be brief with this story. But yeah, I mean, I became a dietitian in 2009. So I've had many, many years. This was not an overnight thing by any means. I would say in the last five years is when I finally figured out, okay, I'm doing all access dietetics and sports nutrition and that's it. But much of my career was exploration. I'll just say that. Um, but to begin, I, uh, when I was going through the process of becoming a dietitian, I was applying to dietetic internships and I realized that whole process was way too hard, way too stressful to figure out where to apply, how to do your application, how to stand out, all that stuff. So uh, I was actually with a friend, another future dietitian, her and I, we decided to start at the time it was called All Access Internships. So it has since changed its name to All Access Dietetics um, because we've grown and expanded, but at the time, it was like, we just really wanted to help people get through that stressful process. And it became the go-to spot for future dietitians, which has been such a dream come true. I've worked on it so hard uh, in the last, gosh, 13 years now. And um, it's finally, you know, I have a team and I, we expanded to not only internship applications, but RD exam prep and then career development. So it's just been a really wonderful thing making a lot of impact in the field of future dietetics. So that was a long journey. Like I said, not an overnight success, almost gave up on it about five years ago, got a business coach that helped me figure out the model and, and just the structure and leadership and everything. And, and it's been cruising ever since. So I love it. That's my full-time job. And then my, my uh, secret identity, I guess, is, well, it's a secret identity on both sides. The people at the Bulls don't know about All Access and people at All Access don't really know about the Bulls sometimes. So I have always been in pro sports. Um, I started as a student intern for the Chicago Blackhawks dietitian. She hired me once I became a dietitian. Uh, I said that I would help her run her business. I was an office manager in high school, so I had some good like administrative uh, skills. And so I got my foot in the door with her and spent four years with the Chicago Blackhawks as her assistant, worked with the minor league team there, and then hopped over to the Chicago Cubs, ran the minor league nutrition program, started it from scratch in 2016 and 2017, and then got a call from the Bulls. Um, the second time I tried to get the Chicago Bulls job, 
I got rejected in 2015, got it another chance in 2017 with some personnel changes. So uh, I was able to start and that was really my dream job was getting the Chicago Bulls. I grew up as a 90s Bulls, Michael Jordan fan and uh, was able to take on the role of team dietitian. I've been there, this, I'll be going into my fifth season love it. It's very manageable. I go in once or twice a week in season and um, work directly with the players, uh, handle, uh, you know, consulting with the food service team and uh, do a lot of individual education and a lot of setting up personal chefs for players. So it's, it's a wonderful way to stay still in the field. And then I can at least speak to that for students like on the all access side that are interested in sports. I can give you know, great advice there too. So those are my two worlds, all access dietetics for future dietitians and team nutritionists at Chicago Bulls. That is amazing. And I actually, I raised my hand because I didn't want to forget to ask this question, but like, how do you keep all of this knowledge in your brain? Because yeah. the sports nutrition world, plus business management as an entrepreneur, plus teaching and helping dietitians remember what a number 10 can is in food service. Like this is a lot of information for you to hold. I mean, what kind of tips do you have for dietitians out there? <laughs> I mean, at this point, what, what's interesting that people may, may not realize is I don't do any of the RD exam tutoring myself, and I don't even coach um, students anymore individually. So I have a team of, of eight get matched coaching uh, coaches, admissions coaches, and then eight uh, RD exam tutors. So luckily, awesome. I don't have to fill my brain uh, that much with all those fun facts. But uh, I also just think having a business coach has been really helpful for me to guide me, give me the roadmap give me those techniques, give me like a, you know, two hour training I could watch or something. Uh, that's been, that's been really helpful too. But yeah, it's a lot. And I will say one big lesson that maybe other new dietitians could benefit from is it, even though the bulls or even though something different might be not a lot of time, it's still a lot of energy. So I find myself actually getting really tired over less amount of hours with the bulls, for example, because it's taking so much energy of, of my brain. Um, and then that's a good thing. I'm more challenged actually in that. Uh, there's always something, there's always more vegetables that could be eaten on that team. And so uh, it, it's, it's like an energy management thing too, that I have, I work on. That makes so much sense when you're, you know, like you said, using completely different parts of your brain and, and managing mm -hmm. everything. I do want to shift a little bit to all access dietetics. And this I know, like you said, you're kind of overseeing it all. And now you have coaches that you're implementing, but I would love to ask you because I get so many questions from students about the exam, about programs, which is hilarious because I'm like, I don't know, like it's so different from when we applied, like it's, it's a completely different thing. So how has and I know this is a very broad question, but how has the test changed over the years or how has the programming changed over the years? Like how competitive is it? What's different from, let's throw back to Jenna, when, when did we like take it? I don't even know. I, I just got an email actually from the Academy yesterday that my digital credential is now available. And it was, I passed my test in 2010. So okay. it's been a long time. Time. <laughs> yeah, we're back in like 2010, 2013 ish area. So, what's changed since then? Yeah, there has been a journey that this profession has been on. I so when I started the company and it was 2008, 2009, the the interest in nutrition was at a peak. So there was a lot of movement around obesity, childhood obesity, that was really driving interest in becoming a dietitian. So. It ended up that there was more interest in the field, but not enough internship spots to fill that. So they ended up having a really poor match rate uh, where it was maybe uh, like 75 to 80% right before I was applying. And then it was 75%. And then in the first five years of all access, it got as low as like 49% match rate. But then they added all these distance internship spots, uh, distance programs being ones where you could be anywhere, find your own preceptors and um, fulfill those hours. And so that was the change that they made. And they also kind of uh, watched how many students they were letting into dietetics programs to fix that. And as that was happening, then around 2017 is when they switched the RD exam to a new, they, they switched it every five years. They 
ask employers, uh, you know, what skills entry level dietitians need, and they take that information plus, you know, information from their education curriculums and things, and they they update the exam. And at that time, that's when the pass rate went from like 80% to 66%. Uh, pass rate. And then it goes down as people continue to try to pass the exam. Um, repeat test takers have a 30% chance of passing, uh, which is not great. So we saw it getting a little better with the internship spots. And then now it's really been an RD exam problem, which is mainly why we added an RD exam division to All Access Dietetics. And that's why we changed the name from internships to dietetics. So we could help with that problem now too. But I will say in the future, so now we're coming up to 2024 where they're changing the requirements to become a dietitian to include the master's degree, which now there will be like eight different pathways. I'm exaggerating, but there really will be many pathways that someone can take depending on their education background. Uh, but I do think there is some excitement around this because you can get people that maybe are in a bachelor's degree that they were not excited about for whatever reason and get into to become a dietitian much easier than has ever been before. So if someone wanted to change careers, uh, maybe they were a finance major, they tried it out, had a BS in finance and they didn't love it, they would have had to go back and get a DPD program, maybe two, three, maybe even four years, another bachelor, and then get an internship or a master's internship. And now they just need a few prerequisites and a two year MS uh, plus internship and that would be way easier. So to me, that's a little bit exciting because it's now easier for people uh, than it has been before if they have a bachelor's degree. Why do you think that is? Why, I mean, I'm sure that that's a very loaded question, but from the perspective of the science heavy background that the nutrition majors have, I mean, I think finance majors in today's world of nutrition with all the entrepreneurship um, that's out there, that can definitely lend an advantage. But with all of the science that we had to go through, I mean, I sucked at all of them and I had to pass them. Yeah. <laughs> Why is this changing now? <laughs> I know. Yeah, you don't want to know, but there's definitely a pathway that exists now, like a program that does not require organic chemistry to become a dietitian. So I know, and I got a 24% organic chemistry without the curve, which was crazy. But can I just tell you that, and this is for all the RDs to be listening, I hope this inspires you. I just remember taking my like test to get into Penn State, like to see where you were going to fall in like your classes um, when you got there. And with science, I had to take like a, a pre-test about chemistry to see which chemistry I was going to go into. And my dad and I were together and he was like, Jen, you suck at science. Like, don't try and pass this. Don't try and ace this test because then you're going to have to start at a higher level chemistry. And I failed the test and I started started in high school chemistry in college. Oh okay. <laughs> so oh this God. is really hurting my heart right now. <laughs> oh gosh, I know. So the I've talked to a lot of educators, a lot of uh, directors of future education model programs, and it is a harder curriculum. It's a graduate level curriculum, so it will be more difficult than your undergraduate DPD classes, right? But um, it is accelerated and it's integrated. Uh, to where you are doing, for, for most programs, of course, there's some exceptions, but you are doing your classwork plus the rotations at the same time so that you can more actively learn and apply. And so they think like that. And this is a model that's used in other healthcare professionals' um, education. So they think between that, the more accelerated graduate level courses and um, even this idea of being student-centered. So it's not that you have to get X amount of hours in a certain rotation anymore. It's that you have to meet certain competencies. You can move on if you, you meet those or you stay longer until you meet those. So it's definitely a different structure, different model that uh, is they're changing it to. So of course, I've, I'll never go through that. So I don't know from firsthand what that's like, but we've been trying to talk to students and talk to directors to, to figure that out. That's awesome. And it's good to hear that there are other directions because there are so many it's funny how many dietitians I we run into in the field that you know they're in their later years in life and they had to go back like you said and do another four years of like an undergraduate degree when it's like maybe they didn't need to do that and they could have still been a kick-ass dietitian and they right. still had a great education 
um, to lean on. And like you said, just fill in those prereqs. Mm -hmm. So I want to go back. I think you said it was, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, but you said it, I think it was 2017 was that drop from the 80% to the 66% pass rate with the exam. Any reason why that is, if they're always updating it, I also have students, I would love you to myth bust this. I have so many students that are asking me, they heard there's a switch coming in 2022 and they're like, should I hold off and take the exam? I heard it's going to be easier. So I'd love you to touch on that myth. And then also what's up with this 30% pass rate the second time? Do you think that's like psyching themselves out? So any tips and, and myth busting you can do related to the exam? So I think first, like, why did the exam get harder to pass like the second time or after that change? Um, there's no indication of really why, like CDR has not come out and said, here's what we did. Um, they're very clear on what their, their outline is, what topics they're covering, what percentage is covered in the exam. So there's not, they're not really hiding anything. I do feel like as the profession continues, this idea of uh, clinical judgment, personalized approach uh, to nutrition, um, kind of like knowing the critical thinking skills, essentially, is what I think has increased in the exam, at least from what I've heard people say. It's not so much about you have to know these fun facts. It's really about the application of those. And so I think the questions, there's harder questions because students, uh, and, and maybe because of uh, the way internships are now or like distance internships are, are harder to control the experiences that someone is getting. But I, uh, you know, I think there's just that lack of critical thinking building that was, is more of an issue now and that's being asked more in the exam. So that, that's my general thing. And that's why you have to study in a different way than like a college exam. You have to study in a way that prepares your critical thinking uh, for it. So to go into, do I think the exam will be harder or easier in the second switch? Again, no indication of one or the other. CDR has not said, we made this harder, we made this easier. Like there's no, nothing. All you can do is look at the past stats and guess that it could get harder because they are trying to accelerate, you know, uh, advance the, the field, make it harder. Um, whether I agree with that or not, you know, that's a whole other thing, but I do think there's just a higher level of critical thinking that they're expecting from entry-level dietitians. And I'm not sure, and I don't want directors to be mad at me, but I'm not sure that curriculums uh, in these programs have caught up to that. And so that's that's where you see this disconnect between like the real world that the exam is, is testing for and then education. And there's always been a gap there. And I think that's a gap in like all areas of all fields of everything, right? So that's what we teach people how to navigate that gap and build their um, critical thinking skills through what our, our method is, which is called the study smarter method. Um, but then your final question, I think was. Um, My final question. I know I threw like seven at you at once, um, <laughs> but it was just, what are, what are your thoughts about that? When you, oh, say, like when you retest after a fail at dropping to 30, is there, like you said, I don't think people come out and say, this is why I failed again or have a higher chance of failing, but do you think it's psyching themselves out of like taking it again? So I do these free coaching calls, like 15 minutes RD exam advice calls. And I have talked to hundreds of students that have failed at this point. And it was so helpful for me to spend the time to do that because I really wanted to fix this problem. And I still do them, you know, now, but I think, first of all, the stat's a little confusing because you're, you're taking a pool of people that have already failed and then putting a, a rate on them. So they're already set up to, you know, not do well, right? Um, so that's one thing. But I also think that people think after one time or two times, they are not changing their method. They just think they need to study longer and harder and more hours, but we find they need to study in a different way uh, in order to actually prepare for the exam. They think, I've had people say, I've memorized every page in this X study guide and I still haven't passed. I'm like, that's because memorization doesn't prepare you for the exam. So uh, so it's changing the way that they study that I think is the, the main factor. But then also you have test anxiety, you have English as second language, you have people that don't have the resources to get new help or new experiences, right? So then they're kind of just floundering. You know, we see people have taken it nine, 10, 11 times. Um, and so that, that is also it. And of course, mindset, as you said, mindset, confidence, um, belief in themselves that they are 
they can pass that exam are all, all factors for sure. So because we do have a lot of listeners that are not dietitians or are used to be, if they are happening, they do happen, let me speak properly. If they do happen to listen to this episode, I think one of the things that is confusing in the social media world, which is where Sammy and I live, um, is a nutritionist versus a dietitian. There's so much confusion as to what a diet, what do you need to become a dietitian? And so you have broken down so well in this episode, all the prep work that is necessary to get to this internship match. And we keep saying match. Um, and I remember when I was graduating and I was told I had to match for an internship program, I had no idea what that meant. And I'm sure that a lot of people listening still don't. Can you explain that process? Like just not the, the full details of it. I know it's super complicated, but I remember people saying like, it's just like if you were at a match for med school and I was like, what the hell does that mean? Like I had no idea. So if you can explain like really what goes into that um, and how complicated that process is, it's just another, it gives us another like level into, you know, it takes a lot of work to be a dietitian. Not everybody is a dietitian out there, right? That's giving nutrition advice. <laughs> Right. So the, uh, the match process, so if we just take it a step back, so in order to be eligible to apply for an internship and then get matched to an internship, you would have to complete, as of right now, you'd have to complete a didactic program in dietetics. That's typically a bachelor's degree, although there are master's programs that um, provide those classes. And then in that final semester before you're done with your DPD is when you would apply to internship programs. These at this point could either be just straight up 1200 hours of supervised practice programs, or they could be uh, combined with a master's degree as well. The thing that makes this so crazy is you apply to these programs, you can apply to as many as you want, but you have to rank them in the order that you want them. And then the programs that you're applying to, they rank all their applicants. And then you take the, app the programs list and the applicants ranking list, put them into an algorithm that I could explain, but it would take 10 minutes in the shortest way of explaining it, uh, and you get matched to one program. Now, it's, it's also concerning because you have programs, especially, oh my gosh, like, for example, New York programs, there's like New York Presbyterian, um, NYU, extremely competitive, where they're getting 100 plus applicants for maybe, and I'm just making up the numbers, I don't know them exactly, but like 100 to maybe 10 spots. So there's this degree of competition and this degree of, okay, you have to go above and beyond in every single area, diet or in your experience, your GPA, your application, you have to really fight for it. And that's, that's what we teach our get match coaching clients is like, how do you go above and beyond? What are the tricks? What are the ways to really stand out that other applicants aren't doing? Because it all matters to get that match. We're both speechless. <laughs> and I think, th thank you for explaining that. I, I mean, there's just so many reasons I'm thankful that I, I was a dietitian, became a dietitian 12 years ago. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's so I competitive know. now, but you did an amazing job of explaining all of that and Sammy's hands up. So I'm going to pass it over. <laughs> so I think, you know, we've talked about all of like, like Jenna asked that question, we've talked about, okay, how do we pass the test the best we can? How do we, you know, match? Um, what are there, and is there anything that we're missing? Like what obstacles, what are the biggest obstacles do you see when working with students that stand in their way of becoming a dietitian? And what are some ways that, you know, these RDs to be can get additional help? I think one of the biggest underlying themes is just a lack of confidence. In themselves and this idea that they get paralyzed and they don't know what to do because they don't know how to do it. Uh, for example, something as simple as let's say reaching out to directors of programs in our admissions uh, coaching, like what do I say? Won't that be weird? But you know, and they're very nervous, and it, the the nervousness or like the lack of confidence is because they don't have a plan or they don't have the strategy. I think it's I tell people on these free coaching calls, it's like you go to driver's ed and you have no idea, you can't even fathom the idea of like driving a car because you have no idea how to do that. You're scared out of your mind, but then you go and you take the class 
and you learn how to drive a car, it's the same thing. So preparation and education on these topics fuels confidence, I think. And you have a lot of power over that. So we're constantly telling people like, you know, do your research, learn about these things, whether it's with us or on your own, and that will fuel your confidence. You will feel more empowered. And that's, a, you know, knowledge is power. It's the, the same thing. And I think that's a really important thing. You see that then as people go on and build their private practices, they're like, how do I do it? How do I make money? And the ones that are successful and confident are the ones, are the ones that go and figure out how to do it. And they teach themselves and they, they get a coach or they teach themselves on their own and they have that power. So I think if the confidence really is kind of the result of the knowledge and educating yourself and knowing how to do something and then going out and doing it. I love that. And I think it, it makes me think of that, that can be a, a skill, right? Applied to anything in life. Mm -hmm. Like you said, I loved how you use the driver's license or driver's test kind of analogy. And I, I think of intuitive eating. I mean, we, Jenna and I both work with chronic dieters or, you know, people with disordered eating that they're like, well, how do I listen to my body? Right. And it's like, well, if you've, if you've been dieting for 20 years to just tell someone to listen to their body, but they don't understand, like understand the principles of intuitive eating or how to apply them. Like it makes sense. Like it takes time and you have to learn. And so I think it's for any dietetic students listening, like it's okay if you don't know, mm -hmm. right. It's okay if you don't have all the answers and it, it takes time to learn. So for uh, any dietetic students listening or anybody that wants to be a dietitian, I know we like just missed like right before we recorded, you just had like this huge free summit um, for, for students, but are, where are, where can they find you if they want to learn more? Where are some resources? Um, where do they live on the internet so students can find you? Sure. Yeah. And this is for people even with a little idea that maybe I would want to become a dietitian someday. And just really quick would want to say like, we're encouraging as many people as possible to join the field. I think our field needs to be much bigger and we should be inviting people uh, now that it's a lot easier um, than it was in the past, at least from a time standpoint to get to become a dietitian. But I would say go to allaccessdietetics.com. We're also on Instagram um, at allaccessdietetics. We'll be launching TikTok in the fall. Uh, so that'll be fun as well. And then uh, on my on the homepage of allaccessdietetics.com, there is a button bright and center right at the top that says need help, email us, click on that, send me an email, tell me about your background and I will be happy to point you in the right direction. I hear so many different stories, different backgrounds of people that are coming through this field. We have people that are, are you know, racing to become a dietitian before the master's degree requirement. We have people that have maybe left their certification or coming back to try to get it again. There's just so many different stories. And I would encourage anyone to uh, reach out and send an email to me and I can, I can guide them personally, like through whatever they need for their next steps. But I think ask for help, get on a, a call or, or email me. And I know that that will be a good decision. I love that. Never be afraid to ask for help and reach out to somebody who knows what they're doing and what you're looking for. So um, we will link all of those links in our show notes. We will link your Instagram as well. We will be excited to welcome you guys on TikTok. <laughs> Jenna and I hang out there. Um, so we will make sure to follow along this fall. Um, and just thank you so much for being here with us today, Jenny. Right, thank you, Sammy and Jenna. It was fun to chat. Guys, thank you so much for listening to another episode of What the Actual Fork Pod. We know there are a lot of pods out there, and we are so grateful that you are here listening with us. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe, like, share with all your friends and faves, and follow along with us on social at what the actual fork pod. We promise to continue to bring you the hottest topics, greatest guests, and the most fun you can possibly have while fighting diet culture bullshit. We love you. We appreciate you. And we will see you next week for a lot more fun.